May all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy, may all beings be free from harm, may all beings love life, may all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today uh, uh, we have a guest, Larry Hansen. Uh, he was an early Shunyu Suzuki student, early 60s, and um, uh, he was at the first practice period of Tassahara, and um, he's gone on to be uh, an expert in sailing by the stars and building high-end homes uh, and other stuff. So, uh, it, very interesting. Uh, so, uh, after our, uh, I'll make a, a, a one comment and pause to meditate, we'll give Larry a call. My comment is, today, for the first time in over two years, I went outside and walked. Uh, we walked to the beach and walked back without masks. Because President Widodo of Indonesia has said, you don't have to wear a mask anymore if you're going outside. Yay! So I, it was hard. It was hard. I've been very good. We've been very good about that. We're not like uh, so many uh, Americans who are so independent and mm, uh, individualistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, we towed the line. And... Um, uh, but I kept feeling like I was doing something wrong and there's something missing. I was a little, can I really go out? I mean, kept getting this thought, oh, yeah, but I'd have, you know. But anyway, it worked. And by the time I came back home, I wasn't even thinking about it anymore uh, until I met you just now. Uh, so um, after our pause to meditate, let's give Larry a call and see what's up with him, huh? David. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> you must be in the middle of the night there. Yeah, I I forgot to call. I never do night calls. And I just, I, <laughs> well, my wife's gone. So I was oh, up really? late working. And all of a sudden it went, ah, I was supposed to call you at eight. <laughs> and you know what? I didn't, I couldn't find a phone number. Oh, my gosh. How did you find the phone number? I didn't. I called you on Messenger. Oh, this is on Messenger where you're calling me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, oh, okay. Well, hey, can we talk? Um, yeah, I think we can, we can talk for a little while, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. What time, what time is it there? Oh, right now it's uh, 12.33. At night, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're in, where are you? In Bali. In, wow. In Sanur. How did you get to Bali, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, uh, by airplane. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great that you're there. I mean, I, we, we just, we spend a lot of time in, uh, we're, Going back to French Polynesia again this year, hopefully to do some more sailing. But uh, now, now, how do you get there? Well, we fly to Los. My my daughter's in Los Angeles. My uh -huh. oldest daughter, she's running a hospital. She's a hospital administrator in L.A. Huh. And uh, so we fly to L.A. first. There's a choice. You can fly to San Francisco, and take what's called French B, which is uh, just started doing the Tahiti flight, and so they they're pretty uh, pretty um, they cancel a lot of their flights because they haven't got it quite figured out yet, and 
So we usually take Air Tahiti Nui out of L.A. And it's an oh. eight hour, a little over eight hour flight. How much? And, How long? Uh, eight about eight hours. It's what? It's, not, it's only eight it's hours? only halfway to halfway to New Zealand from out from Los Angeles. Oh, that's nothing. You know how it's so much longer to go from Bali to L.A. <laughs> it must be like sixteen hours. Or yeah, something. right. I had. Well, you can't. Tahiti can't be that far from Bali. I guess it is. I mean, it's way. It's yeah. It's it's far from everywhere, David. It's like twenty five hundred miles from Chile and twenty five hundred miles from New Zealand. Huh. Wow. It's out in the middle. Of, it's really in the middle of the middle of the of the Pacific Ocean. But What's it's, the it's, nearest it's, thing to it? Um, New Zealand, I guess. Oh, well, the Cook Islands. Uh, Hawaii is five hours away. Hmm. To the north to the kind of the northeast. Hmm. Hmm, yeah. Wow. So it's it's part of that triangle that they are still trying to figure out who, how it got populated. They still haven't gotten that and got that figured got that nailed down. Uh huh. Uh -huh. But it didn't get it didn't get populated until the twelve hundreds. So eleven hundred, I think, was the was what they traced the first settlement back to. So mm. not that long ago, not that long ago. Right, right. But they uh, figured the people came from the Philippines or from somewhere in else in Yeah, probably from Bali. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were here earlier. They were here earlier than that. Yeah. Uh, huh, yeah. I've I I remember reading that. Hmm. So what do you do when you go there? And you were there in last year, right? Yeah, my wife. My wife is. I met my my wife in Tokyo. You, I think you did. did you met my wife, I believe, Masami. Yeah, I can't remember time. where or what the circumstances or what, what are the circumstances of that, Masami. Four years out of the You were what? Four years out of the Oh yeah, it was. It wasn't at Tassahara though. It was in San Francisco. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was somewhere, it was one of the one of the uh, alumni Tassahara reunions, uh -huh. the fortieth, the fortieth. Fifteen years ago, we were. Yeah, she says she's got a she's got an eidetic memory. I have no memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So then, uh, yeah, you met you met my wife, uh, Katrinka, probably. That's right. She was That's with right. me. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was a surprise to me to hear that you were you were living in Bali. So, but that's wonderful. It must be must be a magical place. It has its positive uh, aspects. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, saw some photos of your place uh -huh. when you were. I don't know whether it was when you were doing. You you're part of a band there now, right? Well, I have. Yeah, I I, I have a band that. That I just record songs of mine with it. We just record. We're not. We don't perform. Yeah. Uh, okay. And and they're all your songs. Yeah, I've that I've done that many times before, but I haven't been able to do it this much with uh, studios and musicians this good before the, the because the cost. But it's just so much yeah. cheaper here. It's ridiculously, but it's still. It's still expensive, the amount I'm doing. I'm trying to get a lot of stuff out of the way. So what, what do you do when you go to Tahiti? We, we sail. Well, last year, I was, because I'm, a, I'm an instructor evaluator for a bunch of, of uh, sailing groups like, like Sail Canada and International Yacht Training. So they, uh, people come to me from all over California, Oregon, Washington, up here to, to get certified so they can sail places like the BVIs, the Mediterranean, because they're, now they're requiring licenses if you're within 20 miles of their coast, if you're on a big boat. And uh, so these people come and, and uh, show me that they can, they can, they understand navigation, they understand you know, how to use, how to use the boat, how to rescue people, how to keep people safe, and, mm -hmm. and have a good time. So um, that's that's what I do, David, on the weekends, and then during the week, I'm I'm building a a, a big hospital at the moment. Um, 
Wow. Yeah, so I'm still working. You're probably retired a bit. No, I'm not retired at all. Oh, good. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't There's no retire. such thing, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I tell people. They keep saying, you're almost 77. Why are you still doing this? And I said, well, what, what else am I going to do? This is, this uh, is what I know how to do. You know, yeah. and, and, you know if I stop, uh, then I have to go sailing all the time. <laughs> um, so when you go to Tahiti, what do you do? Okay, I was last year. Last year, I was given. A, that was the first time we were there last year. Oh, and and yeah. So, but we fell in love with the place totally. And uh, I was given a. I, I teach for a, a, a group called Blue Water Cruising Association. They're mostly people who sail long distances around the world and stuff. And and I teach celestial navigation, so I show them how to navigate by the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. Oh. It's just something that I invited Suzuki Roshi along a long time ago on the boat that I was living on in San Francisco. And? And, and he looked at me and he said, oh, I don't think I could come sailing today, but it's good that you, if you have a boat, that you know how to sail it. <laughs> That's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're so not the only meant, person who he turned down going sailing. <laughs> there uh, were other people who wanted to take him sailing. I he, didn't know that. Uh, yeah, um, Duran Kiefer. You remember him? Oh yeah, very much. Yeah. In fact, Duran. It was Duran's boat that I was living aboard. Where? When? In, in well, this is this this is how Duran. Uh, you know, he was washing dishes at Tassajara one day. Right. And he said, he said, Larry, he said, I want to buy a sailboat and start my own religion on an island somewhere off the coast of Mexico. I can't remember where. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, OK, well, I'll I can I, I would be I would love to come with you and find a boat. And he said, OK, well, let's let's go and uh and, and find a boat together. So we, we looked at some really beautiful boats, and he ended up buying a, a Columbia 40. And then he had a girlfriend in Japan, and he spent most of his time in Japan. I don't think he ever sailed the boat until he and Silas's girlfriend, I think her name was Linda at the time. Uh, they, Kathy? They, I was before Kathy. Before Kathy? Or uh, maybe it was after Kathy. She was a, she was a tall... Strapping lass. What year are you talking about? Uh, this would have been 67, 68, probably 68. Oh, Maybe I'm confused. I'm confused. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Anyway, but anyway, there was a, uh, he and Duran and I then, he, he left, he left the boat with me and then I would sail the boat with, with various people and we'd go offshore and, and, you know, try to find our way back to San Francisco. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And Silas yeah. went with you. Silas never Silas never came sailing with me. No. No, it was all other people, other people from oh. Sun Center. Oh. I guess he and Kathy got together must have been sixty eight or sixty nine yeah. because they had a baby yeah. together way back then and uh, you That's know, right. Tassara. Um Have hmm. you heard from have you heard from Silas recently? I can't. You can't hear from Silas now. He's too far gone. But um, I should yeah. call him. I I talked to him uh, a year ago, probably. Um, okay. Uh, and how do you uh, mean he's? How do you mean he's too far gone? Uh, he's got dementia. Oh, does he? Oh, oh wow. yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I haven't. See, uh, the last session I did with him was probably. Oh gosh, it must be six years ago now. He had dementia yeah. then, uh, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, dementia is a word that covers a lot of various things. It's not one a lot thing. Of ailments. Um, yeah. uh, and, um, but I, I keep track of him through Bill Porter. But, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. I know Bill. I know Bill well, too. Yeah. I would imagine you're both up there in that same part of the world. And, of course, yeah. I used to keep track of him through Nils until Nils copped out on us and died. 
Yeah, I know. That was a son of a gun. God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was terrible. Uh. That was terrible. I mean, yeah, Nils was a young man. And, and yeah. so was Tim Aston. So was Tim Aston. Right. He passed away. Yeah. Oh, Tim died a long time ago, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I played banjo at his funeral. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. It was wonderful. He was. He and I were very close. Yeah. And, uh, he lived up yeah. there, didn't he? He did. He did. And and Mel would Mel Whiteswan would come up and visit me often, and and then Tim would come over, and we'd have a we'd have a we'd reminisce about the, the Tassajara days, and and sit together a lot. Wow. Yeah, Tim, was, Tim was a really good good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you did sessions with Silas up there, I think. Is that right? Yeah, called? yeah, many, many sessions. Yeah, we 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 uh, introduced a lot of folks to sitting. Wow, yeah, uh, yeah it was a, it was a, it was good times. Uh, you know, very very chill, very relaxed time on the island time. You know, it was, uh, yeah, uh, nobody was in a hurry. Nobody nobody cared about money. Yeah. Nobody, nobody believed in anything. Uh, <laughs> it was it was really it was good times. Yeah, Silas was always incredibly noble about n not caring about money. I was, yeah, I saw him right. give away a fortune. Is that right? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he could have bought Tassara. He'd tell me he would if we didn't get the money. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, he it's. What he is, but was, I mean, it's not the most yeah. impractical person. It was unbelievable. Um, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, it's been amazing knowing him. And, and yeah, I saw him and Nils a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, like when I was, on. when I was, uh, last time I, I saw Suzuki Roshi, you probably know this story. I think I told you. But uh, I, I was with Lori. Uh, Lori Cohen, for many years at, after uh, I was still at, we were still at Bush Street, and uh, we lived with Silas. Uh, Silas lived around the corner. Uh, we, I lived in, in a house above the, um, on, uh, I think it was on Sutter. There was a Japanese restaurant and a Japanese, um, a kind of a, a, a gro bunch of grocery stores and a hardware store there and sure that's not in, in post Japantown. that's post post yeah it was in japan town there yeah and we lived on the second floor with richard weller the guy from pennsylvania who was a millionaire and uh and then uh i saw suzuki roshi with him laurie and i came up here and i came up here for a two-week holiday david and uh, to to uh, build for molly jones's mother Remember, I don't know if you knew Molly Jones. She came to Zen Center. She uh -huh. followed me there from uh -huh. the University of Michigan. And then uh, she invited me up here to, to build her mom's studio. That uh, 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 She was a ceramics instructor at Antioch in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh -huh. And her students were all getting drafted to Vietnam. So she said, she said Larry, why don't you come up and... I built. I bought this place on Quadra Island, and I'd like you to come up and build my studio for me. So, Lori and I drove up in my old Citroen, and uh, and I got out, I got out of the car, and there was this guy sitting on a backhoe, and he said, "Yeah, when you get done putting the foundations in for this studio, then would you come and build me an addition?" And my friend wants you to build something. And I was looking out over the whole of Georgia Strait, which is this big, vast expanse of water that goes from it goes for a hundred miles down to Vancouver, mm. and uh, I said, "This is a beautiful place that that Janet Jones had purchased. It was 160 acres of waterfront, and uh, she got it for forty thousand dollars U.S. at the time with a farmhouse." So I said, "I, I should go back and I should go back and and uh, ask ask the authorities if I can work here and instead of going back to San Francisco." And so then Lori and I. I think I told you this story. No, I had, listen, I don't remember anything. Just tell me, good Lord. <laughs> so Lori and I, Lori and I went back across the, uh, the, uh, um, to Vancouver, and 
got on a ferry to Sydney, which is near Victoria on the island, on Vancouver Island. And I walked into the immigration office with these offers of employment. And the guy said, oh, you're a carpenter. Well, you should come and you should come and, uh, and, and, and be a carpenter in Canada. And here, here, here's a little postage size card that, a lot, that says you're a landed immigrant in Canada. So he stamped it for me. And, and he said, what about the ladies in the car? And I said, well, one of them is my wife. And he said, well, then she's a landed immigrant too. And Lori, come on in here. And the other, the other lady is just visiting from Texas. Her name is Rachel Cummings. And he said, does she want to be a landed immigrant? And I said, I don't know. I'll ask her. And was, <laughs> within 15 minutes, all three of us were landed immigrants in Canada. Oh, my God. It took, it took Masami. It took Masami like two years to get her landed immigrant. Car. Yeah. And it's, you know, she had to go through medical exams and show her university degrees and stuff. Back then, it was just like, oh, you're warm. You're, war you're a warm body. You, and we need people. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> It was pretty crazy. So then, yeah, then we moved. We moved to Quadra, and uh, I set up a zendo. Uh, first, th first thing I did was build a, build a, a, a sixteen by sixteen, what became a, a kiln shed. But in the early days before we built the kiln, it became my zendo, and I invited all the people from Quadra to, to do sashins. And then Lori and I drove back to San Francisco, and I said. To Suzuki Roshi, this would have been just before, I guess, his illness. Uh, was really, he at Page he Street? Came on. Yeah, he was at Page Street then. Yeah, and I said, uh, Roshi, I'd like, I should, uh, I should, you know, I should get, I should be ordained uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people zazen up on quadrant, doing these sashins like, like three times a year, uh, seven day sashins, and. He said, you know what? He said, I don't want to make any more big shots. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I think he had great. just become, I think he had just become di very disillusioned with, with what was going on with, with Dick and, and Silas. He said, but I'll, I'll tell you what, he said, I'll send someone up to help you. And I said, oh, fantastic. I don't need to be a big shot. I don't want to, I'm not a big shot. And, and so he sent Silas up and Silas, Silas just, just appeared at one of my sessions. And I said, oh, you must be who Suzuki Roshi meant when he said he's going to send someone up to help me. <laughs> oh. And Silas said, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Wow. But yeah, he said, let's, 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 uh, you, you got a great setup here. Let's do this together. So he would come up, he would come up three times a year. And we would do sashins in various places. And one day we were doing this session up in a place called Granite Bay in the middle of the winter. There was only, uh, I had a four wheel drive uh, uh, Land Rover, old, old, old Land Rover tr pickup truck that we managed to get up there in the snowstorm and this blizzard, along with 10 other people. We were sitting in this old farmhouse. Wow. And the snow didn't stop falling for seven days. And on the sixth day of the session, we heard this big noise. It had been so quiet. It had been not a sound for set for six days. We heard this big noise, and we looked out the farmhouse, and there was this huge light shining through the snow, and it was this guy on a timber jack with like three foot three foot diameter wheels, and they used it for hauling these big logs out of the bush, and his name was Ray Loma, and he I knew him from being a quadra, but he lived all by himself up in the up in the north end. And he was a logger and he came driving in and he said, he said, Larry, he said, is the Hindu here? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I got a call that from San Francisco that this, this fellow had passed away and I was supposed to find this Hindu guy named Silas and tell him. Mm. So I, said, I said, well, yeah, Silas is here. So Silas and I went out and we took this call from San Francisco. And that was that was the moment that Suzuki Roshi had passed away. Mm. So somehow the San Francisco had found us in this remote place. Do you know about what time that was? Uh, it must have been, it was at night when we got the call because it was dark. But I think it was either either before dawn in the morning or it was... Or it was late at night. I don't remember which. Uh, oh, which he that, which he died at like four in the morning or something. 
Whenever okay, the, so it because been. they were starting a session. Uh, okay. I, I I bet you were on the fourth day of a session because you okay. would have started on the first, right? That's right. Exactly. Uh, and he died on the else. fourth, and the session in the city because of you know all the unusual circumstances started on the fourth. Yes. Uh, and. Um, so, uh, and he died, you know, while it was dark, and they called you pretty soon, sounds like, yeah. Wow, well, yeah. Yeah, so it would have been first thing in the morning. It was just, I think that's right. We were we were just about to have breakfast, I think, when, when he came here and he drove in. And it was, you know, in the winter here, it doesn't get daylight until about 9 o'clock in the morning. Right, so. I was just realizing that, that the morning yeah. there would extend. So they they could have called you at eight eight thirty yeah. or something yeah right yeah so we rode on this timber jack back to his uh little little farmhouse and and took the call from san francisco so mm. that, was, that was a pretty incredible time mm. Mm. and then then silas and silas and i continued to do those sessions for for many years and this until he started doing um sessions down in the palindrome in uh in port townsend we had this big, uh, big kind of uh, auditorium in the woods mm -hmm. that, he, that he got possession of for for his sessions, and yeah, we did uh, probably probably ten sessions with him there. Oh wow, wow, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, then uh, yeah, never got back to. San Francisco uh, again until we started doing these Tassajara reunions. Huh? Goodness, goodness. How did you um, uh, come? How, how was it you first came? Well, let me ask you this this way: Where did your um, path start? You know. Um, well, my the path my path started uh, when I was quite young and I was reading Kerouac of course and Ginsburg and I don't know how that happened because none of the I was in Toledo Ohio and that's the other end of the of the world from any any spirituality or or any interest in 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 you know the uh, Japan or Japanese mm -hmm. things or Buddhism but uh, I was uh, I, I started reading Kerouac and and I, I read Walt Whitman. I think Walt Whitman was the beginning of it all. Oh, yeah. You know, Leaves of Grass, the original edition, the little tiny book that just describes his enlightenment um, when he was 40 years old. Uh, prior to that, he'd just been a printer and never did anything, never never wrote a poem. And all right, so how did it progress? Oh, then then I, I, I went to... Uh, I was enrolled in the University of Michigan. I was in in, in forest ecology hmm. time, and um, and uh, my father passed away. So he was he was um, he was opening a uh, a fishing camp in northern Ontario. He was they were all a bunch of uh, executives from various companies in Toledo, and they their propane pilot light went out one night, <laughs> and I think they were all probably drunk. And none of them woke up the next day. Wow. There were six of them that passed away in this cabin oh. from the propane. So, oh. uh, so, so I, I ran out of money and I moved to, I, 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 so I, I had been during, uh, during my university time, David, I was shipping out in, on the Great Lakes freighters huh. in, in the summer. That was my summer job, uh, along with fighting forest fires one, one year in, in Southern California. Mm. But then I went back to Michigan all the time, and and uh, and uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And then, when my father passed away, I I, I decided to ship out on, to the Orient on a on a big freighter. So I moved. I went to San Francisco. I drove my little Peugeot to San Francisco and stood in line at the National Maritime Union for a few days, and waiting for a boat. And I met this lady named uh, Gail Cunningham, who had a house right near Zen Center, just around the corner from Zen Center. And there were a whole bunch of folks that, a bunch of, bunch of hippies that lived with her. She was studying 
at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. She was an oboe player. She was a fantastic oboe player. Hmm. And her father was vice president of the New York Stock Exchange. Hmm. And he had a he had a girlfriend who who uh, was in San Francisco. So he would come and visit. And so Gail couldn't bring her father to meet her actual boyfriend, who looked like Doctor Strange. He had hair standing straight up about about a foot off his head and all around his head. And, 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 and we would go to, we went to the Charles Lloyd concert one night to hear him play his flute and Charles Lloyd paused, paused in mid riff and, and, and looked at, looked at Gail's boyfriend and said, far out, man. <laughs> Remember, forget that. <laughs> and then, and then one day Gail looked, Gail turned to me and said, so I would, I would pretend to be Gail's boyfriend because I had I had pretty short hair I, you know I was never really a, a, so to speak real hippie and uh, I had different agenda so I I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I I would pretend to be her boyfriend I would borrow a suit jacket from one guy and a shirt from another guy and a pair of slacks from another guy and <laughs> we would go meet her father and go for lunch right? and one day she said to me she said Larry I'm going to see this see this guy down the road he's going to give a lecture and i said you know gail i said i know i spent so much time in school i really don't want to hear another lecture she said oh but come with me it's really cool he's a he's a he's a zen master and i said oh wow well that sounds different that sounds really interesting what so year this would have been 1964 oh or 63 or 64 wow yeah very early, very early on. And so I, uh, I went with her and there were maybe a dozen people in downstairs, down, down in the uh, lecture hall in, at, at Buchanan Street. And Bush Street. Bush Street, rather. And yeah, Buchanan was the street that I lived on, by the way. Oh, it yeah. Yeah, it, it was Buchanan. Yeah. And, uh, but Bush, yeah, we went, so we went and we, we heard Suzuki Roshi talk and I thought, wow, this guy is like, he's like speaking right at me, right into me. Uh, you know, he's like, he's like, he just grabbed me. And it was after that, there was really no escape from, from him. You know, I started coming in the morning at 5 a.m. To, to sit at, at Bush Street Zendo and then went back to the University of Michigan, uh, you know, telling everybody about, about about Shinryu Suzuki and 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 got Lori to come back to San Francisco with me and we moved into that that place on Buchanan and then eventually moved into Duran's boat and then uh, we bought Tassahara and I remember going to Richard Baker saying you know uh, I'm I'm a carpentry apprentice I, I started a kind of carpentry apprenticeship in San Francisco while I was there and I went to Baker and I said, I hear you're, you know, you're starting to build this place and I'm a carpentry apprentice and I would, I would be happy to come down and help build the kitchen. And so that was right, I think in the middle of the first practice period. And he said, yeah, come on down and you can do a Tangario. And that was the seven day, five day, seven five day, day. Tangario. Five day. It was five day, five day. Yeah, maybe it was five. Yeah. It was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and so that was yeah that was uh, the first. Uh, the, the, and then I just I, I I you know lived there for about a year and a half I think until it was time to hit, hitchhike back out to um, out to the coast. I walked across the the mountains to Big Sur and, and mm. to Esalen, and then got in a got in a truck with a with a with a long haul trucker who picked me up on the coast highway and he said, where have you been? And I said, oh, I've been logging. And because we were, I would go up with Coben and, and uh, Katagiri up into the woods and, and fell trees with chainsaws. And I was trying to keep both of them from cutting their arms and legs off uh -huh. because they were, they were not very skillful. Um, neither one of them were very skillful. Uh -huh. so, uh, so we felled all the timbers for the kitchen. Oh, that's so great! So I told this guy, I told I told this long haul trucker David that I was uh, I was working I was I was logging in in the mountains, and he said, "Oh, wow!" He said that pays really good, 
and I paused and I said, oh, I was, I was, I think I was paying a dollar a day <laughs> to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of our conversation. He didn't say a word to me all the way up to San Francisco after that. That's <laughs> <laughs> funny. That's funny. Well, yeah, that's... what what do you remember about uh, you know Sokoji and the scene there? Who do you remember? Um, you know, I. It's funny, you know. I remember, oh gosh, it's been so long. I, the names, I, I, I know, I knew uh, Bill Kwong was, of course, I remember Bill because he, during Kinhin, he would walk and his, his toes would, would go up almost vertical when he, when he walked in Kinhin and then he would, then they would clamp down on the floor and then he would take another step and, his toes would fall down to the floor, and so that was that was astonishing to me the way Bill Kwong walked. I can't. I, I just don't know how many people have commented on on that, especially on Saturday mornings when he bring you know he he did the the breakfast. Uh, yes. There and then he'd come yes. out and bring the tray for the Buddha, and then he'd bring yes. the tray for Suzuki, and he was always. Like that, he had a sense of drama and theater, you know, and he said, and he totally, he, he'd go very slowly, and it's like his toes were like independent going across. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't the only one who knew. No, I've, that. I've heard a few other people comment on that. I mean, it was striking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and of course, of course, Mel. I mean, I knew Mel really well, and, uh, and, you know, during 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 this last uh, first first year reunion, like like Mel and I, you know, we always had our foreheads touching whenever we saw each other, and and just our energy just intertwined. Mm. And so when I told Mel at the last reunion, you weren't there. I guess uh, you must have missed the invitation or something. No, but what year? It was. That was five years ago. It was the fiftieth one. I live, I've been here nine years. Okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but they probably they probably sent you an invitation, I'm sure. Yeah, I can't. I don't remember that. I mean, I haven't been yeah. back. No, no, of course not. Yeah. But, uh, so, so I told Mel, I said, Mel, I, you know, um, my Buddhist, I told, told Mel my Buddhist name, but I, I said, you know, I never had a, I've never had my Raksu signed by anybody. And he said, oh, well, leave it with me and I'll, 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 I'll sign it. So uh, he was very, very generous that way. So then he, he, he wrote a beautiful little poem on the, on the back of it and, and uh, sent it up to me after he, after he signed it. How did you have a Raksu that wasn't signed? When did you get it? I made it. Oh, when? Oh, a long time ago. Oh, but yeah, huh? So it was, it was, it was something that. See, I left just before. It was when everybody was doing that. Um, but oh, Roshi, but Ro, but then I moved to. I came up here, right? You left, and, so you were there for the sewing, but you left before the ordination. That's right. Because you certainly could have been in on the first ordination in 1970. That's when it was. Yeah. See, yeah. I came up here in '69 in the spring of '69. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then, um, so that, that, that was the story of that. So, mm. Mm. but, uh, yeah, so it was, it was interesting. Um, I still have my Tassahara pants that I wear sometimes. Oh my gosh. The, the old gray ones. Remember the old gray bell bottom? Yeah. Bell they're they're they fat so comfortable. pants. Fat pants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the lace tie on the top. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. They're still, in good, they're still in good shape. I guess I don't wash them enough. Huh. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, I'm really shocked. Be... <laughs> Why don't you have yours? No, I don't know where any of that stuff is. Uh, <laughs> my robes have been in, in, I have my robes in storage. Uh, yeah, I have, yeah. I haven't worn robes since I came back from Japan and, 92. 
Yeah, you went. When did you go to Japan? Eighty-eight to ninety-two. Eighty-eight to ninety-two, and you you were at uh, Eheji. No, no, no. I uh, I I was married uh, to a woman named uh, Elin, and yeah, we uh, lived in Okayama and uh, next door to Sogenji. And Okayama. Yeah. Okay. And do you know where Okayama is, Masami? Yeah. Yeah, it's between Hiroshima and uh, like Kobe. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's yeah, it's it's one of the stops on the Shinkansen line. You should have half a million people or something. And uh, uh, Shota Harada there. I studied with him there. Uh, okay. I never. I did spend uh, uh, over a month with. Uh, Katagiri at a little international temple they were trying to get going down in Kyushu well, when I was yeah, first yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and and Harada, uh, I don't know if he's still going, he's getting pretty old, but, uh, you know, he'd go to Whidbey. He has that place on Whidbey, One Drop Zendo or whatever it's called. He still does. I don't know if he's, I, I think he might still be going there. I never heard he'd stopped. I'm in touch with them, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I've been there to Whidbey, and I've seen him in America. Uh, Ken Sawyer yeah. uh, would go up to Whidbey and sit sessions with him for years and years. Yeah, I know. I remember Ken. I remember Ken Sawyer. Yeah, he was one. Yeah, these names, all these names that you bring up, I, 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 I'm totally, totally familiar with. I can visual, I can visualize their faces. Yeah. The, I can't visualize the names of folks very much anymore until I see them, and then I remember them. Like it's like boats with me, David. I can, I can know. I know the name of every boat on this coast, but I don't know the owners of the boats I, uh -huh. until I see them, and then I can speak with them. That's great. But, That's great. <laughs> Do you have any memories of Suzuki? Uh, well, yeah, lots of memories of Suzuki because when uh, I became his driver for a while, when we were at. When we, we used to drive, uh, when I was at Tassajara, I would drive him into, I was like the, I, I used to drive the old, uh, um, our old power wagon. Yeah. The you, old green. Back then, you, you, the power wagon, you probably drove him out on the Toyota Land Cruiser, though. Or... That's, no, it was, it was both, both the Toyota Land Cruiser and the power wagon. Uh -huh. We'd go to Monterey and go shopping. Uh huh. And then we'd end up, you know, he'd, well, well, Roshi, what do you want to do now kind of thing? And, and he'd say, well, let's go to Carmel and, and go to the beach in Carmel and just, just hang out on the beach with the seagulls for a well, while. That's so, unusual. It was usually hard to try to get him to do anything like that. I, oh, I yeah, always well, that was, would. Uh, yeah. Uh, I always tried when I was driving him or Kobun. Uh, uh, I remember driving Katagiri. No, but I drove him with Coburn, and and I Coburn was easy. We'd screw yeah. around all day long, <laughs> yeah. and come and Dick Baker would yeah. be mad at me. He, <laughs> uh, he, I remember he said once, "I can't trust you." I'd say, "Yeah, but Coburn can." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's great. Well, yeah, you remember that. You remember the day at Tassahara when Baker was so pissed off at me, he was going to throw me throw me out. No, it was, no. No, it was right after. It was right after uh, we were. We were. Uh, it was. It was New Year's. It was New Year's, and we were. So everybody got, you know, got sake in the zendo. Yeah, I think it was sake that that was served in the morning in the zendo on New Year's Day. Yeah, one of the and and so uh, we were. <laughs> we everybody stopped drinking after one cup, but Ed Brown kept bringing sake for tim Aston and myself and oh. so we would just keep drinking the sake that he kept bringing oh that's funny. and we we hardly could get off our cushions we were, we were so drunk tim and i yeah and they got we got kind of helped helped out assisted out out of the zendo um after, you know after breakfast and everybody was pissed off at us because we made him sit there for so long while we kept drinking ed brown sake oh that's funny and then, and of course, Richard Baker said, well, these guys are just total, these two guys are totally out of line. I want them out of here, talking to Tim and I, right? Uh -huh. And then Ed Brown, Ed Brown came to our defense and said, 
no, no, no. <laughs> it's you that are, that's out of line, Dick, because we, uh, I just kept, I was serving and they kept accepting. So there's nothing out of line at all. So Baker had to completely back off. Good. Well, you know, he was just blowing steam out. And we're exactly. not going to get kicked <laughs> out for that. Uh, uh, in uh, at Sogenji, and of course it was uh, pretty strict. There, it was very, it was totally vegetarian, which you know, like oh, yeah. family temples aren't necessarily at all. Yes. Well, they pretty much aren't. Uh, right. And uh, you know, there wasn't any alcohol, and there's of course a lot of alcohol in temples in Japan. But was it, yeah, but on, I didn't know that. Oh God, yes, on. Uh, <laughs> on uh, uh, on uh, the New Year's, there'd be sake, and people yeah. could drink all the sake they wanted. There wasn't nobody cared, you know. Yeah, they exactly. could get totally exactly. drunk. Um, actually, people yeah. didn't. You know, Japanese sort of they're very tolerant. If you're drinking, it's sort of like, well, he was drinking. You know, it's, it doesn't yeah. count what you do then. Exactly. You know exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but anyway, one one day one day you'll 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 like this. One day I took uh, Roshi. I think I think you know this story. But one day I drove Roshi into Monterey, and he said, "Let's go to let's go to the beach and you know in uh, at Pebble Beach at uh, um, Carmel." And I said, "Okay." So we're driving through Carmel, and he said, "Let's stop at the candy store." Uh -huh. There's a can, and I said, "Okay." So he. Stopped at the candy store with him, and and I bought him a bag of, a big bag of jelly beans, and then we went down to the beach together. And he would, he would throw the uh, throw this, a jelly bean up in the air, and the seagull would go grab it out of the air and squawk and wow. fight over it with another seagull. And then he'd hand me one, and then he'd throw another one up at the seagulls, and then he'd hand me one, and then he'd throw another one up at the seagulls. He'd hand me one. He wasn't eating them at all. And then and then. Uh, he threw one up at the seagull, and I reached out my hand, and he didn't give me one. He just laughed. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> uh, that is was... funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, I'm, I'm... It was fun. It was fun. I, we, yeah. we had really good times. Uh, I remember driving driving him from, from, California, from San Francisco down to Tassajara, and he'd always put a cushion behind his back so that he... His back was was supported in, in, in kind of zazen fashion. Um, I, I always loved the way he would come behind me, and just just give a give a good push in the, my lower spine. Right. You know, to right. keep me from slouching. Right. 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 Yeah. Sometimes with his stick, his uh, short stick, oh. teacher's stick. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Give me a little poke. Right. <laughs> right. And straighten up. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I still got a I still got a Kiyosaku in the house here that I got from um one of the monasteries in in uh in Japan when I was living in Japan. Oh, uh yeah, really, really. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so I, I went I, I after I came up here, um Gary uh what was his name? Tolson. Yeah, yeah. Knew, remember, oh yeah, sure. He was a he was a he, he <laughs> he was a he was a piece of work, but he he was uh, he got he he came up to visit me at, on Quadro one day, and he said, you know, I've got this big project in Japan. Would you like to come to Japan and and work with me on it? And we'll need a bunch of carpenters to help us. So I know that you have a lot of contacts, and and you could bring some other people. And I said, sure, I could. I'll, that'd be fun. I'd, I'd, I'd enjoy that. So we, 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 he, we went to Nagano, and we lived in Nagano just at the, when the Olympics were starting, and did some work on the Olympic projects. And then I uh, met. I, I found this little little temple, just above Nagano, um, where this uh, it was it was Kukai. It was a Kukai um, temple. Shingon or Shingon, yeah. And uh, these guys sat an hour every morning at, at 5 a.m. So I would come and, and sit with them in their in their zendo, mm. and they welcomed me. And and uh, I sat there for the three years that I was that I was there. Wow! In the mornings with them, and got to know got to know them really uh, some of the some of the head priests there really well, and 
and had a, had a really enjoyable time. Uh, they were they were totally vegetarian. They had uh. Uh, we had we had I had meals with them. Never had any alcohol, but they were very strict, very strict uh, doing their zazen. Every, you know, mm. and uh, yeah, mm. I, I didn't. I never really found out anything much about their uh, the difference between their shingon uh, teaching and and uh, in ours because it was. We just sat. We just we sang We sang the Prajnaparamita after after sitting, and and then I would I would basically I would I would leave the zendo and go and go to work. Yeah, so I didn't spend a lot of time uh, uh, chit chatting, and anyway, I didn't speak Japanese, so I was uh, I was kind of, uh, but I was you know totally immersed in their in their practice while I was there. Yeah. Yeah, and it, the guy guy Milk, uh, Muke was his name. He was ninety years old. Ooh, and just when I just when I got there, he had just passed away, and uh, he was famous for. He became famous. They did weird things. He became famous for sitting in the snow for twenty four hours, um, uh, just a loincloth on, mm. uh, just because he could. So they they had all these. And one guy. They had they had these magic practices that they wanted me to get involved in. One guy said he could put it, he could pierce himself with a sword. Did I want to come and watch? And I said, No, no, I, I think I'll pass. You know. Uh. <laughs> he said, Yeah, I can I can stick a sword in my body and pull it out without any any injury. And I said, No, I think I'll pass. Uh, you you go ahead. <laughs> huh. you have fun. You have fun doing that. So you know they they were they were they were an interesting bunch. Wow. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But uh, yeah. So I don't. Like I said, I never really figured out what what they were what they were about. But I really, they were they were tough. They were they were great. They had they all had great seats. I would get there at five in the morning, and it looked like they'd never stopped all night long. They were still just sitting there like stones in their in their places. Mm. Impressive. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it was very impressive at mm. the time. But then uh, then I met. I met my my dear wife now, and uh, we moved. Uh, she came with me back to Canada. Ah, yeah. yeah. You met her in Nagano. No, I met her on the. Tra that's that's a good story, Dave. I met her on a train. Uh, I was heading. I had my boat was being uh, stored at the Vancouver Maritime Museum because it was a classic, uh, full length mahogany african mahogany planked vessel that had sailed here uh from from scotland it was built on the clyde in scotland and this mm. uh this this uh british admiral uh, british vice admiral had sailed it here single-handed he was passing away he sold it to me he was pretty much almost gave it to me um and so when i was in japan it was being looked after by the maritime museum and i every six months i would leave and come back and I was sitting on the train, uh, kind of on the way to Sh on my way to Narita Airport from Ueno Station, mm -hmm. and all assigned seats. And I was reading Ernest Hemingway's short stories, mm -hmm. minding my own business. I thought, and this elder, elderly Japanese lady came to sit down beside me and looked at me and thought. I guess she she expressed herself that she didn't speak English, so she didn't want to sit with me. But she put her daughter in the seat next to me, and this young lady turned to me and said, uh, "She looked at the book I was reading. She turned to me and said, have you ever been to Northern Michigan?' In perfect English, and I said, "Why do you ask?" And she said, "Because that's where Hemingway used to trout fish." And I said, "How do you know that?" And she said, well, "I just did my thesis in English literature." At university, and I said, "That's wild." I said, "Where are you going?" She said, "I'm going to Hudson Bay to look for whales." And I said, "Oh, that's really cool." So we were on the same airplane to Vancouver, and then we parted ways. Um, we sat together on the airplane all the way to Vancouver. Mm. She gave me her phone number, phone number which I lost. Oh. Got back, got back to Japan, and a couple months went by, and I got this phone call. How come you never called me? And that's Masami. That's my wife. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Wow. And then, of course, she ran away. Um, 
uh, from home to come to Canada with me. And uh, her parents disowned her for a couple of years. They wouldn't even, there was no communication. They would, it was like she was gone from the family, right? Uh huh. And then her mother got, had some courage and decided she would fly to Canada to see if her daughter was okay. Mm hmm. And she and she bought a friend of hers who could speak some English. And they got off the plane in Campbell River, which is the closest airport to where we were. And, and the first thing her friend, her mother's friend, said to me was, "Do you like Shirley MacLaine?" <laughs> I said, oh, I, I love Shirley MacLaine, <laughs> of course. So we were fast friends. They had a ball. We we became close friends. So we go back and forth to Japan now uh, often. Um, I'm going in July again. Because mm. her dad's, her father's a dentist. Well, where's she from in Japan? Worked on uh, Saitama, right next to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, not very far from from uh, from Tokyo at all. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So her father and her brother are both dentists there. So I get free. I'm I'm fortunate. I get free dental work. In Japan. In Japan, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I have, and then we're gonna fly. Yeah, I have definite memories Okinawa. about dental work in Japan. Uh, 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 they might not apply to your experience. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I think her parents, her her dad is a very good dentist. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> you you didn't have that experience? No, I I taught English to my dentist, and he was fine. Oh, but they just had a thing of dragging it out forever. And oh. I people would go fifteen trips for something that in America you go to one or two. Uh, I mean, I saw <laughs> that over and over, uh, and of course that's how they got paid. There were certain strange things with doctors, and like doctors didn't get paid unless they did something, like prescribed something. So they, anybody that walked in the door, they'd prescribe uh, antibiotics to and. Stuff like that. It was sort of weird. Ah, um, wow. But um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, no, I'm getting a I'm getting a bridge done, and the, I was quoted ten thousand dollars for the for the bridge here in Canada. And so her dad's going to do it for, in ten days. Um, once I get there, I'll get ten days. Four teeth. Yeah, I'll get four teeth pulled, and then he'll he'll get the lab to. Oh yeah, jump I see. On this. Uh, yeah, he's not going to be working. So, yeah, no. So while I'm while I'm there, we're going to go to go to uh, Okinawa. Oh yeah, you know, for a, for a while and hang out. Have you ever been to Okinawa? No, no, I never have. I but yeah. let me tell you one thing. I had um, two bridges put in last year uh -huh. because I got hold of a little money, and I had two missing teeth, and. Uh, Let's see now. One side, I had three. Uh, I had a bridge and like three crowns in it. On the other side, yeah. two. And yeah. the total cost for all of that, very good quality, everything. You know, the they had to pull one tooth, and you know, I had to get an X-ray, and um, was about. Uh, it was about a thousand dollars in Japan. No, here in Bali. Oh wow! Oh wow! In Japan, I had um, medical dental insurance that was fantastic. It hardly cost me anything to get anything. Wow! It was like dollars was the copay. No, but here, good. You can get good dental work. I think it was about. It might have been fifteen hundred or something. Yeah. Uh, so how did that work out? Is that is it still good? Oh is, yeah. Does it bother you? Oh yeah. No, no it's great. It's yeah, great. Yeah. God, I had a hole on both sides, uh, and now I don't. Yeah. Um. Uh. Anyway, so you went to Okinawa. Got to come and visit you one of these days, David. Hey, please do. This is a good place to visit. We live in Sonor, and uh, Sonor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know it's it it's like a really good beach I, for swimming because it's a coral reef out there, 
And yeah. it's never too busy. And um, um, it's, uh, it, I call it sleepy sonora. Well, I got yeah. I heard it called sleepy sonora, so I call it that. Uh, and uh, you know, they said so. You bu- you so you bought a house. No, no, you don't buy here. I mean, you can sort of, but you have to have a partner because you really can't own anything. No, no, we rent. Okay. We rent. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, Fabulous. And we and so the ocean is warm. And what what is the color of the of the lagoon inside the reef? Oh, it's um, it's it's uh, it, it's not good for snorkeling. There, you got to go elsewhere to snorkel. But everything's turning gray. You know, the the coral's all dying. Uh, yeah, I, it is. It is in it is in Polynesia a little bit too. Yeah, yeah um, it's. Um, I'm, the oceans are, are too warm. It, yeah, yeah. The, turns out that coral is very sensitive after like two degrees change. Uh, yeah. Can die off, and some of it can adjust. But nah, I don't. I don't know. It's. Uh, Mm, bad. And, you know, there's been such depletion of the fish. I, I was snorkeling here in 92. There's just no comparison. It was beautiful right? and colorful and yeah. everything. I've done a lot of snorkeling here, but uh, not anymore. I haven't gone snorkeling in at least two years. But You still swim? Oh, I swim all the time, yeah. I go. Yeah, that's that's what you do for your fitness, eh? Well, I do. I did yoga. Did? I do yoga twice a week. Uh, oh, good for you! I uh, yeah. swim. I walk. We walk. We don't have a vehicle. Uh, nice. And uh, you know, I, I have to push myself to do it enough. Uh, but we have a yoga teacher who comes here. Everything's just so much cheaper, you know. Uh, uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, food, food is uh, inexpensive too, and and what and good. I guess. What'd you say? Food. Yeah, that's true. Uh, food there, food there is inexpensive. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's when when our band practices our uh, yeah. records. I cater it. I have it catered, right? Oh wow! I get them what they nice. want. I get them their favorite thing, and it costs about a dollar and a half each. Huh. Right. Wow, uh-huh. and uh, so uh, come here. And I've been around studios in America. You know, if there if there's something catered, it's like really <laughs> posh. You know, they're spending tons oh, God, of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so in in Bali, they have this thing called a gamelan. Well, gamelan's right. all over Indonesia. That's um, well, I, I don't know to what extent. I mean, there's gamelan in other islands. Uh, gamelan okay. is Indonesian music covers a wide array of instruments. It's uh, traditional, and there's different types of yeah. gamelan music. Um, there was a there was a professor at the University of Michigan, I'll never forget, in, in, in the summers, we would go to his place, and he, he had brought back from Indonesia a whole bunch of gamelan instruments. Oh, my. So, so we would have a, a real we we would just we would just jump into them and have a big cacophony of of sound. Oh, that's right? funny. Grant Fisher was was uh, uh, I don't know if you remember him from he was he hung out with me at Zen Center for a while. He was from University of Michigan. He's a poet. He married Diane De Prima. Oh, Grant, and, yes, <laughs> yeah, and, and so Grant and. Grant and Diane and I and uh, uh, the tall the tall bloke that Diane was married to for a while. Alan, Alan Marlowe, Marlo, yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember uh, I remember Alan, you know, with his all his gold rings and stuff, bowing and in the line at to Suzuki Roshi after morning zazen. Uh huh. And and Suzuki Roshi would just be was totally enamored of Alan because he was such a character. Yeah, Suzuki liked Alan. Dick Baker liked Alan. Coburn, yeah, loved Alan, yeah, um, or oh, da- for sure, you know. Uh, I mean, in fact, yeah, Coburn this... was with him when he died. Oh wow, really? Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he died of AIDS. Yeah, yeah. No yeah, surprise. I huh? that, <laughs> yeah, I was surprised that uh, that Diane didn't didn't succumb to that from from that period of time, but um, yeah. 
uh, well, no, Diane, look, AIDS was 80 on, on. I don't think Diane was doing... With, she wasn't with Ellen then, no. No, no that's right. That's for no, sure. No, no, no. That was long past because she and she and Grant got married and had Rudy together. Yeah, yeah. I was I was going over to there. I was I was I spent a lot of time at, at uh, Diane. Yeah, Diane and I were very close, and I, I lived with we, Grant and I lived with her. No uh, kidding. For, at the on the Panhandle, uh, at, on uh, uh, what was it nineteen fifty eight or whatever it was the address on the Panhandle when the diggers would come by and we'd distribute food and then they would they would distribute it all over the all over the uh, city wow uh, she had a big she had that big garage underneath the, the house well i i was over there once but i don't remember anything about it. that's when i met them that's when you know when when they'd come from new york and were just starting to sit she'd been there before yeah. she'd been there before and had uh, sat with suzuki but she brought yeah, yeah. back. Hey, listen, you remember Jeannie, her daughter? Of course. I was there when Jeannie was in diapers. Far out. And, 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 and the young, uh, young Alan, right? Um, I'm still friends of theirs on, on, a, on a thing called Strava because I, Masami and I swim like, like uh, 4,000 meters a week. And we're, we're on a swim team. And, and, uh, and, so Alan, young young Alan. Is, no, uh, no, his name's not Alan. It's um. Oh, it's Alex. It's, it's Alex. Uh, Alex. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Alex. I used to chase Alex around the house when he was about four years old or five years old, and we'd play this game of tag. Right. And one day I cornered him in a corner, in the in the house there at the Panhandle, and he turned around and 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 he turned around and with a really angry look on his face and said, up against the wall, motherfucker. And he was pretending he had a pistol in his hand. Right? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that was young Alex. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I used to bake bread. I used to bake, bake ta Tassahara, um, uh, uh, Tibetan barley bread every morning. Oh, wonderful. House. That's what I did when, for my rent there. Yeah. I, oh. was, the, I was the baker at Diane's house. I, in the panhandle? Yeah. Oh, they hadn't yeah. moved over to Page Street yet, huh? No, no, I didn't know that they'd even. I, I left before they moved. Um, oh. They were still in the Panhandle when I was there. Uh, yeah. she moved. We would drive. Yeah. We would drive into. We would drive into Zazen in the morning in her in her Volkswagen uh, Volkswagen van. Uh huh. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful! Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'm I, I'm in touch with Jeannie. Uh, Quite a bit. Oh, nice! I did a long podcast with her, very long, several hours. Maybe yeah. the two. No, I divided it into two. It was so long, wow. and it's pretty far yeah, out. No, it's, it's pretty far out. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, Jeannie's on my one of my Facebook friends, but we don't. You know, and they they now that Rudy's Rudy's developed this uh, Dieta Prima Park in San oh, Francisco. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's been working on that for a while. Oh but, yeah. Uh, they're, That's so cool. They're trying to get the, I think the mini park on Page Street. The, one of the mini parks named after called, her turned into. Yeah, yeah. I think they're going to be successful because they've got a lot of support. Yeah, and she was the poet laureate of San Francisco of the city. I know, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Masami and I saw her. Uh, I don't know. How was that? About ten years ago, Masami, we went to. After the fortieth uh, reunion, we we uh, we went to her house oh. in San Francisco and had had uh, had tea and and biscuits and stuff and oh. reminisced about the old days. Yeah, mm. yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Grant is still still alive. He's down somewhere in the in the deep south. Mm. He was a grocery a grocery store clerk for a while. Hmm. Uh, we still we still kind of correspond. Oh, really? And, My. And we I send each we send each other poems and stuff and hmm. and uh, yeah he was uh, he was a very really, very close friend also from from the University of Michigan. Um, oh, yeah. So, so we came together after I was at Tassajara back to the University of Michigan and dragged a whole bunch of people out to Zen Center <laughs> who followed me out there, like like Molly Jones and Grant and. Oh, Molly the other, Jones. The other people. 
Yeah, yeah. Do you remember her? I was just in touch with her uh, last week. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. She's in Hawaii. Okay, because she... Uh, she was she was who got me to come to Canada. She invited oh, me right, to come to right, Canada. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. That was Molly. Right, yeah. right. Was, yeah, and her then, mother. Right. Yeah, and then I mean, Molly, her mother bought that hundred and a quarter section of land for for forty thousand dollars. And I think after her mother died, her mother died in a plane crash in Campbell River shortly after, a couple of years after I got I moved there, and I was mm. working for her mother building her building her place. And then she died in the plane crash. And then the, uh, the, the quadra became so popular that the land prices there went, went rocketing. And I think Molly and her, and her brother, uh, Michael, sold that place for like $5 million. So Goodness. They did, they did very well for themselves. So I'm not surprised she's, she can afford to live in Hawaii. Yeah, she was playing <laughs> baseball. A few years ago, remember uh, Diane Goldschlag, my first wife? Yes. Yeah. She's she's still playing baseball. Oh wow! Mo Molly's Molly's having some physical problems right now, but um, okay, I don't think she's playing baseball, but she might be. I don't know. Yeah. But softball, softball. Okay, softball. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So your health is still is is good. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I've had a few minor problems, a hernia. Uh, okay. But, um, you know, I had a hernia operation here, and we don't have any insurance. You know, it's too expensive at our age, and just don't make enough. Live pretty much on donations. Uh, our, sure. We need the donations to live. And um, so I had a hernia operation, and... Um, you know, a private, it's a hospital I walked to for it. It's the newest hospital in, in Bali. And it's it's public hospital. And, uh, uh, the, the, you know, I, I, I stayed three days in a private room with, you know, uh, bringing me meals. And, you know, I had a buzzer. I could get anybody anytime. Was, and uh, the whole thing cost about $1,000. Wow, that's fabulous, man. Yeah, so living here is a nice substitute for having insurance. Um, yeah, so the same, it's the same in, pretty much the same in Canada. I'm too old now. I, when I was, when I was doing, uh, I, I worked for a bunch of companies and I had my own construction company on, on the islands when I used to have my Zendo there and I used to build houses for, like Stacy Keach and Redford and uh, and uh, Lou Carlino who did the Great Santini and wow. all those guys and they they built you know I built mountaintop chalets and cut the timber on the property and and build roads into their properties. Goodness, yeah. So that's that, and then anything that I couldn't I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do everything from what was on the land, like toilets and sinks and stuff. So I'd have all that stuff barged in. Um, but, you know, the, 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 uh, the insurance, the medical insurance up here was, you know, when you're young, when you're young, when you're below like the age of 65, pretty much everything is covered by, you know, the, the company that you work for, or your company, you can pay all your employees insurance. It's very cheap, but you know now that I'm going to be like 77 in July, nobody's interested in in giving me cheap insurance anymore. So I have to I have to pay for Blue Cross, which gets expensive, and it only covers like 50 percent of dental. Although it covers everything. I had five knee surgeries, David. I had five knee replacements. Mm. I've only got two knees. <laughs> that's that's um, ambitious. I. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah I, they were only partial because i did you know i did the hawaiian iron man i've done i used to, I, I you know I, i'm still my wife and i are doing a triathlon in in may in victoria oh my god with my daughter she's coming up and uh 
you know, my wife has in, in, actually just in the last week, my wife has scheduled a minor operation, which is going to preclude her from doing the swim. We were doing a uh, we're doing a relay, not not an individual half Ironman anymore, but because I can't run because of my knees. Um, but we're doing uh, so my daughter's coming up from California mm -hmm. and it turns out I'm going to I'm going to do the half Ironman swim and she's going to do the run and the bike because my wife is uh, is uh, was going to do the swim and then and then I was going to I'm going to do the rest with my daughter but uh, yeah that's so but these five knee surgeries they were only partials right so what they do is they put a titanium they put titanium uh, cups and the uh, ball and socket basically is what it is yeah. on, on the interior uh, uh, compartment of the knee. And the, the first one that they did was, is, is fantastic. It's called an Oxford knee. It's a partial, not a full knee. So it's recovery. His time is much shortened. Uh, the, the left knee he did, he, he, uh, found that the upper and lower bones were slightly different size. So he used different size titanium, pieces which was a mistake and it kept dislocating the the little polyethylene uh plate that's in there that everything rides on kept falling out <laughs> in the morning i'd wake up with a big lump on my leg and i couldn't stand up so he'd have to do it again yet in the fourth time he talked to this guy in oxford who developed the oxford knee and the guy said well i've got this new thing called a vanguard knee where the polyethylene cup is riveted to the titanium so it can't dislocate so that's what i got now and after the fourth try he he got it right on my left knee the first one's horrors but Knock yeah wood. i know knees are 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 they, they take more time to heal than hips yeah apparently apparently um i don't i think i know one person who's had a across the road from me here who's had hip surgery but it depends on your on your condition and your age, I guess. How, how how fast you heal. You know, only one. I know, I know a number of people that, um, my have had hip hip replacement. Yeah, uh, a, a person very close to me. I think who would rather I didn't mention who it was, is mm -hmm. um, having a hip replacement, right hip. Now this is a new technique, and listen to this, outpatient. Wow. Yeah. She's going in. Holy cow. She's getting a new hip and she's going home. <laughs> Holy but, cow. But when she gets home, she has to, you know, after it, she has to be very careful getting home. You know, she'll have help and then she has to rest, you know, and stuff like that. Oh, of course. But um, it's, uh, I just couldn't believe it. You know? No, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing because, I mean, even for my little partial knees, I was, I think I was there three days each time, right? And uh, in the hospital yeah. before they before they'd release me, and I had to do you know show them I could walk up, I could walk a little bit with a crutch, you know, and and do all this stuff, all these maneuvers, and and uh, then they let then they finally let me out. But that's crazy because the hip is major. Yeah, it's I know major, it's major just major area. I know it's just amazing yeah. what is done yeah. these days. Mm. Are you the same age as me? Yeah, I'm. I turned seventy-seven in February. Okay, next February. No, I turned past tense. Oh, you turned. You turned already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a little bit. You're a little bit older than me. I'm, I'm, my my seventy-seventh is in July. Yeah, there was one time that I was um, a lot older than you when you were just uh, born. But now you're catching <laughs> yeah, up, closer. and we're almost the same. <laughs> uh, I think it was was it Samuel Clements who, who said that about Robert Frost. I think the, the, that was his comment to Robert that when he was born, he was half his age, and then he was now he's catching up. Who said that? Samuel Clements, uh, uh, Mark the guy Twain. Who wrote, uh, Mark Twain, Mark Twain. Yeah. Mark Twain knew Robert Frost? I, I'm almost positive. Wow. I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive. Because the two of Mark, them. Robert Frost died I, when I, I, I was in, in my late teens, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. And, and, of course, 
Yeah, of course, Mark Twain was much, much older than that. So it must have been someone else. But it was Mark Twain's comment about somebody that he, some other poet that he knew. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, do you know where Mark Twain comes from? Missouri? No, the, the, uh, the, 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 the acronym for his, it's, it's, his nickname. It's uh, the depth of, uh, you, you measure off a, a boat in the river. With a lead line, yeah. Yeah, so you cast the lead. Uh-huh. And then you read the you read the fathoms off of the off of the little pieces of leather on the on the line that you've thrown in the water, and when you get to two fathoms, that's Mark Twain. Oh, oh, that's neat. I just had that vague memory, you know, from. Yeah, no, I, you're the, you're one of the only people who who ha even had a glimmer of hope of answering yeah. that question that I've ever spoken to. Huh. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's an old memory. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Indeed. Well, anyway, this is uh, this is fantastic. Yeah. to get to speak with you again. Yeah, this is great. I've really enjoyed it. Um, let's see. Take takes me back to when I was when we were both like nineteen or twenty, sitting down at Tassajara and and, uh, and ringing the bell in the morning. I I used to have to ring the ring the bell to wake everybody up running down the running down between the between the cabins yeah i did plenty of that i'll tell you uh -uh. and then phil whalen phil whalen and doug uh doug smith no 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 philip wilson philip wilson and doug yeah and after and, evening after evening zazen yeah we would we would we would be full of energy you know and and we would start singing these old rock and roll songs in front of the cabin. I shared a cabin with Silas and Doug and, uh, and si Ed Brown. Silas and who? Ed Brown and, and, and uh, Doug Smith. Doug Smith. Huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, the, we shared the first cabin right across from, from Suzuki Roshi's cabin. Mm. And uh, and I remember and this. We would, I remember you singing there, and uh, you, you yeah. got a little loud. You had to you had to cool it. Yeah, we were singing these rock and roll songs, and 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 then the next day, <laughs> Roshi was up giving his lecture, and he said, "Yeah, and last night there was this kind of raucous rock and roll group outside my cabin, and." I was going to get up and say something, but I, I realized that it wouldn't go on forever. And we were so embarrassed. That was that was the end of that. Uh -huh. I remember that. I remember that. I thought, I thought <laughs> you know, everybody, there's so many. I, I'd stay up late, too. Uh, yeah. So many people, yeah. man. I, I mean, as soon as the evening season's over, bang, they're in bed and asleep. Oh, God. And remember when everybody took a vow to stop smoking? No, I don't. Oh, there was a bunch of smokers, right? They'd all be, you know, hanging out and hiding down at the, down at the, uh, down by the beehives, right? Smoking their cigarettes and stuff. And then everybody took a vow. We're going to stop this. This is, and they said, well, somehow I ended up as the, the keeper of the tobacco, right? They all gave me the tobacco, all their, all their cigarettes, uh -huh. all their pipe tobacco, all their pipes. And, you know, they just took a vow to stop, right? And, and then one by one, they would sneak into my sneak into my cabin and, <laughs> and beg for and beg for a cigarette <laughs> uh -huh. until they were all smoking again. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's funny. That was, That's funny. That was that was fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the and and we had peanut butter. I remember Doug always um, wanted some peanut butter. So when I went to town, I would always buy him a big jar and. I remember it got so cold. Remember it got so cold that one year that, that the, our peanut butter froze in the in the washroom in our cabin. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you so when cold. you're getting into December, uh, January, there's so little sun. Uh, oh man, in the valley there, extremely yeah. cold. You know, yeah. Lama Govinda was there in the dead of winter for some reason, and you know he he yeah. wrote uh, the way of the white clouds about. Uh, being in Tibet, and he had stories about, you know, boiling water and then thrusting their hands in it and breaking the ice. Already it's ice breaking it. You know, there's descriptions of extreme cold. 
And he said the coldest place he'd ever been was Tassajara. That's funny. Man. And you know, it wasn't anywhere near as cold as Tibet. It was the conditions and yeah, everything. the humidity and stuff. Yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember in the way of the white cloud, he's talking about you know a guy riding horseback in the mountains in Tibet and. One side of your body would be getting frostbitten in the shade. The other side is getting sunburned in the sun. <laughs> oh, huh. Huh. yeah. Anyway, up here it's the same. I mean, I, you know, I sail offshore. I teach offshore sailors. You know, I've got a one of my students now. She just bought a big offshore boat, and she's taken off single-handed after my instructions for the last eight years, and she's going around the world. There's an 80-year-old woman who just came back to Victoria. She's one of my students. She sailed unassisted around the world at 80. Oh, no. And you're kidding me. It, no, no, no. Jean Socrates. Yeah, you can you can find her on, you can Google the name. And she's she was 80 years old, unassisted around the world in a 40-foot naiad. And now... She, after that, she she went and visited a bunch of friends in in, in Australia, and now she's uh, come back from Australia, and she's fixing up her boat. Her boat's a mess because she got off it and just just left it in Victoria. Now she's come back. She's fixing it up. She's going to sail this summer back to back to Australia with her boat and live there. Oh my God! And she's like she's like eighty two now. Oh, so. And she's by herself. She's just fit as fiddle and happy as happy wow. as, as can be. Yeah. So anyway, the same story here. You know, we got this little sheltered bit, bit of water outside of where where I live here. It's called Georgia Strait. It's between Vancouver Island and Vancouver. It goes all the way up to Quadra Island, all the way down to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And, and we race. We do this thing called the Southern Straits Race here. It's an overnight, we do a bunch of overnight sales um, with my students. And this last weekend I was in, I was in hurricane force winds in the Gulf of, in the, in the Gulf, in the Straits here. And it's only the second time in my life I've experienced hurricane force winds when I've been sailing. And both times I've been in Georgia Strait, right next to my house. Wow. Yeah. And it's very rare. I mean, I've been sailing here since. Since I got here and sailing in San Francisco and out to the Fairlawns and down to Monterey and up to Eureka and all over the place. But and, uh, I was in the Southern Straits race here a few years ago and there was a fellow who had sailed the, the uh, Sydney Hobart. And Sydney Hobart is, is like famous. It's got, you know, you've got these 40 foot swells out there with the wind waves on top of that. And it's a really grueling race. And, and we were in the Southern Straits in 2010. And he said, you know, he'd just come back from doing, he sailed all the way back from the Sydney Hobart and participated in our local race. And he said, the conditions in our little local race and this protected water were worse than the conditions in the Sydney Hobart. Huh. <laughs> and yeah, boats, boats sank and people were lucky to survive. And yeah, it was, a, it's pretty, pretty neat uh, being, being a sailor in, in, uh, in these waters. And yeah, I'm really, really enjoying that. Uh, but I'd love to sail to Bali <laughs> when I grow up. Yeah, there's a lot of sand. We live just, you know, 15-minute walk from the beach. And there's a lot of boats nice. down there, a lot of sailboats. Um, nice. And we have a very close friend that has one that's taken us to a, a nearby island. It's just 30 minutes away by fast boat. So yeah, yeah. that's... Uh, that's our, that's, we go there on vacation. <laughs> awesome. We leave here and go there. It's actually part of Bali. It's a, there's three little islands over there that are part of Bali. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, they're, uh, they're really neat. Um, and boy, we've seen a lot of change though since we came. Uh, I bet. And a lot of development, eh? Yeah, they never stop here. They never stopped. Yeah. It was called yeah. the Overbuilt Island when I was here in 92, and they, they haven't stopped. Wow. Uh, the, so you get typhoons there? No. Right? I've never even heard really? of one. No. Wow. No, I, look, the storms on the west coast of the United States, I've experienced, you know, living right uh, right on the right on the water, right? Above yeah. it somewhat, but... Uh, you know, maybe 
50 feet higher, you know, and a nice 45 degree slope down. So a very stable, uh, but just horrendous storms sometimes in the Pacific. Holy. I haven't experienced anything like that here. I've experienced high winds and stuff where you got to, you know, and rain where you... you, you got to close the shutters or something. Yeah, we well, got to get... Well, we'd be outside. Um, Do you have windows? Do you have windows in your house? Well, of course we have windows. Oh, well, in Tahiti, they don't even... A lot of houses don't even have windows. They just hang curtains in the openings. Oh, well, uh, in the old days... Uh, they didn't, but no, we have a, we have a house. Proper, proper house. Yeah. It's really nice. Uh, uh, we like it a lot. It's two story. It's basically built of cement and brick and cinder block. Uh, and, um, you know, and it has a traditional, well, modern traditional roof, you know, a tile roof. Uh, yeah. and, uh. Um, I was telling Ken Sawyer, you know, who became a very, very high end builder. In yeah, I remember Ken. In, in, I remember Ken. And and what was the other? Uh, who's the other builder at Tassajara? Who Paul Disco went to Japan. Paul Disco. Paul Disco. Yeah, I remember Paul too. Yeah. Yeah. Paul and I were there together, and I, when I was playing carpenter, and he was playing carpenter. Well, you were working for him. Maybe you were, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. No, he was the master. Yeah, he taught me a lot yeah. for sure. A lot of a lot of skills that I that I'm really grateful for and, and have served me well in, in, in my career too. Yeah, yeah. I just did a podcast, I guess, last week. It went up a week ago with Lynn Brackett, Richard Baker's uh, brother in law, Jenny Baker's brother, who who uh, builds Japanese homes here. I see, uh, yeah. A very fine work. Uh and um, you might want to check, uh, you know, there's a page for him on kuke.com. Uh, but it's, just go to East Wind Inc. East Wind Inc. East Wind Inc. Yeah, okay. you see the stuff he's done. Beautiful, man. Wow. Really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. When I was in Japan, David, I was like, I was working with some some temple carpenters. Oh, and they taught me. They taught me a lot of their joinery oh. when I was there, and so I, I, you know, joinery without nails, all hidden, hidden fastenings, no visible fastenings anywhere. Yeah, um, it was. It was a. It was a really. I was really grateful for that three years working with those guys. Wow, and I, I brought a lot of that back. Obviously, when when I moved back and started building for these Hollywood people. Oh wow, um, that's I really built, interesting. I remember Gary Tolson. Told me, I mean, I, mean yeah. uh, I, I talked to him while he was going over there with you. He told me, he told me you were uh, that uh, the, the the work he was doing was basically Western. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of Western stuff that he was doing, and then I got into uh, working a little bit for the Olympics, uh, doing the Athletes Village. That was a funny. That was a funny time. I was there. We got a we got a big container of of. Uh, of uh, uh, gas fireplaces for the athletes' village, because of course everybody it was a it was a Winter Olympics, so everybody all the Westerners needed a fireplace, so they had to put a fireplace in every one of the, one of the accommodations. So we had two hundred gas fireplaces delivered to Nagano. They came from Seattle in a container, and I look I opened the container and looked at them, and they all said NG on the box, right, which is natural gas, and I I looked at uh, my supervisor is a Japanese guy, and I said, you guys don't use natural gas here. And he said, no, 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 no. And I knew that because from cooking, it was like jet fuel. It was like but butane and propane and natural gas. And uh -huh. It was a mixture of mixture of, 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 of gas, gases. And so I called, the, I called the manufacturer in Florida of these fireplaces, and I said, I've got 200 of your fireplaces in Nagano that I'm supposed to install in the Athletes' Village for the Olympics. And he said, you can't do that. They, they'll melt. And I said, well, he said, no, don't, don't, don't hook them up, he said. So I told, the, I told the foreman, I said, you know, we cannot hook these up. The burners will melt, and the whole place will burn down. And so I came back. 
I was at the luge site for a while. I came back to the athletes' village. They'd installed them all, but they'd put red lights in them all. Uh-huh. <laughs> and up on the roofs for the chimney, because every everybody needed a chimney in in Western Hemisphere, right? So they they built these they built these um, plywood chimneys and they put brick wallpaper on them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow what what instrument do you play do you when you you sing right you yeah sing i play guitar but i just use it for writing uh uh i have good professional uh musicians yeah, okay. I, I don't play on anything i show them how to play yeah. it i play yeah. you know i i i a lot of times i use chords and stuff they don't know and i have to sure, show so you'll show them the chord changes and yeah stuff. uh yeah, and, uh, but um, I'm. I, I really. I never think of myself as a musician. I just write songs. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was interesting. I've been. Uh, you might know I've been playing five string banjo for a long oh, time. Oh yeah, yeah. And and uh, and recently, when we went to well, last last winter when we went to Tahiti, I found this fellow. I started. I don't know if you've ever heard. To like to to Alva Piti or any of these Tahitian uh, ukulele uh, groups, uh, they're they're so different, so much energy, so so vi- vi- vivacious in their in their playing, and then they've got this the the women do this incredibly fast hula, incredible, and the the men dance and they they bring their knees in and out and they. they they're, it's just fabulous to watch. Wow, they're they're playing and they're and they're dancing. So I decided, heck, I'm going over there. I'm gonna I'm gonna find somebody local who builds ukuleles. And I found this guy um, uh, who lived on Mo'orea, which is the magical little island that Cook discovered when he when he sailed there, named Woody Howard. And they they, they uh, uh, he's from Hawaii, but he's he married a Tahitian girl. And he's lived on Moorea for the last 20 years, and he builds, he builds from scratch. He builds ukulele out of out of out of uh, very rare Tahitian woods. So I, I was corresponding on WhatsApp with him for about a month before I went to Tahiti, and I I said I want you know I want a tohu wood ukulele, and I want you to put a bunch of because he has he's a pearl farmer. And he has a he has, he has a pearl farm in the Tuamotos in the in the atolls that are about a hundred miles away from where he lives, and that's where he goes for holidays. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to these little little Tuamotos where there's no internet, there's no connections, there's nothing. Uh-huh. Right? So he built me this magical magical. I'll send you a picture of it. This magical ukulele with these teardrop, um, uh, like like pearls all over the front of it. Out of this book match toe wood, and and uh, it was great. I, I, the first day we got we sailed there. We sailed in, took our dinghy ashore. It was pouring down rain. I had a big big poncho on, and uh, and and went to his little shop and 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 uh, picked up this ukulele, and then we took it on our sailing adventures all over to Huahine, which is this magical little island where hardly anybody ever goes. And we anchored in, in this wonderful beach at the south end of of, of Huahine Ite, and we went ashore and got and rented a bungalow for a few days. Got off the boat, walked down the beach on Christmas Day with Masami, and there was this whole family, like three generations of people from Huahine locals, and they were they were singing and playing this incredible ukulele music. They, there were four guys who had ukuleles. Two guys had had uh, um, guitars, and one guy had a wash tub bass. The, the, the grandfather had the wash tub bass, mm. and all these generations of, of folks, dogs, little kids, were playing on the beach, diving in the eighty-six degree water. And Masami said. Larry, she said, you got to go back to the cabin and get, get your ukulele. And I said, Masami, I, I'm not good enough to play with these guys. She said, oh, come on. So I went back to the cabin, brought my ukulele down the beach and jammed with these folks for most of the afternoon, playing Bob Marley songs and their 
all their local songs and ah, oh, I swear to God, it was, it was unforgettable. Mm. And I brought so then I went back to Moorea. We sailed back to Moorea on a on a return to Tahiti, and I went back to Woody's place. His daughter was there, beautiful, beautiful Tahitian girl. I said to her, I said, um, Woody has the a Tahitian ukulele that that was here when I when he gave me my Hawaiian shape. Tahitian ukuleles are totally phenomenally different. They're really high pitched and they play them at a lightning fast speed. And I said, I'd like to buy that one to add to the one that I already purchased. So she went into the shop and she said, no, I think he must have taken it to the Tuamotos because he went there on holiday. But here's a hybrid that is very similar. So I said, OK, I'll buy that one. So I bought the hybrid to bring back home. And of course, on Air Tahiti Nui, you can that you can check in your baggage and your baggage includes a ukulele. You can have your baggage plus a ukulele as a carry on. I know it's a Tahiti new. <laughs> they don't say guitars, they say or violins, they just say ukuleles. And so my wife brought a ukulele back and I brought one back. And you know, I've been playing it for hours every day since I returned. Oh wow. And trying to try and my wife can sing the the Tahitian songs now. And I'm trying to learn the words. Oh my and, gosh! Uh, not, so when we go back, we'll we'll be able to play with these folks again. That is very impressive. Wow! <laughs> yeah, it's just so fun. Man. Wow! That is... uh, these these instruments are just just amazing. It would they cost me about I think it was about eight hundred U.S. for each one of them. Wow! But, uh, you know they're they they would sell for four times that here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 So. Hmm. They're hanging on my wall next to my surfboard. Hmm. Well, pick up <laughs> some more and sell them when you get back. <laughs> oh, the funny thing is about the, uh, because when when he came back from the Tuamotos, I called him and I said, thank you, your daughter sold me the, the hybrid that you built. And he said, oh, that was you that bought it. This is all on WhatsApp, right? He said, oh, that was you that bought it because... I built that for a French lady who had to leave before she could pick it up. And I was going to send it to her, but now I'll have to make her another one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, the people there, I mean, like people everywhere, no matter where you go, are, are fantastic. It's just the bloody governments that... And the religions that cause yeah, all these problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know... Uh, nationalism and ethnic problems, which a lot of that is whipped up by governments. And uh, yeah, politicians and priests can cause a lot of trouble. They can, man. Yeah. I remember Arthur Rambaud, right? My favorite French surrealist poet. And he was like, he he died when he was 20 years old, but he, yeah. he was a magnificent poet. And one of his, one of the things I'll never forget, he said, I'm a holy man. On a pilgrimage, I throw lice on priests. He does. Wait, no, say say it again. He does what on priests? He said, "I'm a holy man on a pilgrimage. I throw lice on priests." Oh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> that's Arthur Rambo. <laughs> anyway, what what we what we experienced at Tassajara was was so profound and. And you know, too profound for expression, almost right. But yeah, it was uh, it was uh, uh, it saved Tassahara and Suzuki Roshi definitely saved my life. Me, there's a few people I've met that um, nothing would be the same if I hadn't met them. Yeah, I mean, completely not just you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Life is life is life is. Uh, I mean that that last uh, thing that I saw that you. Um, put on on Instagram, I believe it is that about Suzuki Roshi and we're like snakes in a can. Oh right, um, right, right. Yeah, that that just struck a real chord with me, and right, and, uh, and I, I I shared it on my Facebook page. I hope you don't mind, but what? Of I course, was... everything I put up is free for anybody to take or do anything they want with. They can take the whole everything. They're yeah. Not, Thank you, it's, David. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, that's the whole point of Cuke Archives to make everything freely available. Um, 
Sure. And uh, yeah, that was that's that was a struggle. That was not uh, company policy. And uh, okay, you know, uh, uh, but uh, now it's sort of accepted, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Ha <laughs> 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 um, Yeah. Those uh, the Instagram is done by my associate uh, Peter Ford, uh, who I now call the managing director of Cute Archives, and I'm on special projects. And uh, I started putting up um, uh, lecture excerpts from him years ago, and I'm still doing yes, it I right six that. days a week on the course, blog. Yeah. But I'm a lot messier, and I and I I'll put all sorts of stuff up there. Uh, Peter yeah. went back to when I first started and used those for the Instagram, which instantly was something my wife uh, uh, kept telling us, do Instagram. You know, that's what people are doing these days. And so finally, yeah, we did it. He did it. He's really good at, sure. at um, technical things and getting things done. He's, yeah, amazing. Uh, and... Um, but he He's did a much States? better job. He did a. He presents them much smoother. He, did, he does. You know, he'll edit them more. He's more selective, uh, and uh, he puts a picture every time. He puts a lot into. It. He does it seven days a week, and that's only one thing he does. We're working on. Uh, uh, he's working a lot on uh, uh, on Suzuki lectures. He just did a light edit. We've done. I don't know. Maybe. Over the years, a couple of hundred light edits of the lectures. I'm editing the audio now, uh, which has never nice. been done. You know, he coughs wow. constantly and uh, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff. And, uh, you yeah. know, uh, there's been a lot of work done on the audio, but it's never been altered. It, you know, the length, he might pause for 15 seconds <laughs> or something. Yeah. Right? Uh, and yeah. I love it, but uh, I'm just getting a very slow start. I've got two, you know, other things I'm doing. Hmm. Yeah. Well. No, I learned. I learned. I learned so much from from Roshi, and my only regret, if there is any regret, is that I was so young at the time that I was kind of awestruck all the time mm -hmm. instead of being, instead of having, you know, just being his friend. Uh, and even when I was with him, it was. It was I was on pins and needles all the time trying to figure out you know um, what you know not to not to do a, a misstep where he would think I was just a goofy kid. Well, that's good. You know? That's and, good. That's better than being a friend. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, it happened. It yeah. happened at the right time. And uh, exactly. You know. And then and then of course there's that moment when. When you see into his being, when you become him and he inhabits you forever, and that's that's what eventually happened. Um, and, you know, I, you know, there's without human beings, there are no Buddhas. Right. So everybody has to come back and just deal with with uh, all sorts of things as, as they as they're born and die in every moment. You know? That's so, right. You know, it's like it's like crazy. It's like it's such a wonderful, wonderful teaching that, that he shared with us. Yeah, and I'm absolutely forever, forever grateful to have to have met him. Yeah, you know. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, I love uh, talking to people uh, who were there, and and actually, people who weren't there who've been very affected by him and by his students and by just the waves that have come out from that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So many people he touched with his, with his first book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I mean, it's, it's, I've still got the first edition of that book. Oh, wow. It's all rag, ragged and, and wow. <laughs> the years are gone. And, but, you know, I've given so many of those away. I keep just buying them and keeping them in my library to give them to folks yeah, as, hey, they, as they appear in my life. By the 50th, anniversary edition uh, i wrote the afterward for it i wrote the afterward for the 40th and the 50th the f oh wonderful the, okay i will do the that. 50th i knew i'd learned a lot more 
then from the 40th yes. uh yes. and and also keep making believe it or not corrections to the book nice there were these awesome. there were these russian guys that translated it and they were in constant touch with me and they were going you know i have the original lectures on uh, yes on Q, on shunyusuzuki.com uh and I think except for two of them. And um, uh, and we've only got a few audio tapes. A few were just discovered. But uh, the, the transcripts were obviously, um, and, and we can see it in the uh, uh, from the audio tapes we've got, were very close to verbatim. Um, and they'd go back and read uh, the, the original transcript compare it to what there was. And they've made a few, you know, some some really interesting corrections. And uh, I made some corrections in the 2001. I mean, the, uh, the you know, I, I got Richard Baker to change his introduction or forward and, and, okay. and not say that Suzuki led up pacifist movement in Japan during the war, which would have been yeah. absolutely impossible. Uh, sure. And um, and I said what he did was very noble and, and remarkable, and the people who were with him uh, continued meeting uh, together, uh, but not a pacifist movement, no. And, uh, and no. you know, the wrong year for his birth and... Uh, the Russian guys, though, pointed out that the height of the waterfall was wrong in Nirvana, the uh, waterfall. Uh, yeah. uh, and they made, they found every little tiny detail you can imagine. They made, uh, and it's all it's all recorded on uh, zmbm.net, all the changes okay. that have happened in their notes. And uh, uh, anyway, um so this fiftieth edition that you speak of, that's that's available with to Shambhala. Oh, of course, or? yeah, it's okay. their pre, I, I it's no their idea. premium version of it. Yeah, uh, fabulous. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 look at it today. Yeah, I'll look for it today for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So if we come to Bali, um, we'll we'll definitely look you up. Oh yeah. And, yeah, uh, we can we can discuss that uh, with uh, email in depth. Yeah, in depth. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and and yeah, we'll do I, I do some yoga and do some do some sitting with you and play some music. I'd love to, I'd love to meet your musician friends. I'll bring my Tibetan uh, Tahitian ukulele. Oh, on. do do. Uh, yeah, we can. Probably, <laughs> you know, I never jam. No, we just practice for recording. I'm never. I'm not a jammer. I'm not a. I don't yeah. play with other people. I mean, I can, but and I yeah, don't. Yeah, but you don't. Uh, no, I'm no fun. You're a poet. You're a poet. You're a great poet. <laughs> <laughs> Katrinka, you know, will say, "Oh, there's a party. Bring your guitar." I say, "No, I don't do that, Katrinka." I used to when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, if you had been in this, on this beach in Tahiti with this family, you would play with them yeah. because they were just full of yeah, joy. Sure, yeah, sure, I can I can do it like that. But you know, basically, music I like to hear like that is is better than what I do. There's all sorts of music sure. I like to hear. I don't I don't really write and make the music I like to hear best. I mean, it's cool. I, what I do is really fun. It's neat, but. I like jazz, and um, uh, you know, I grew up around classical music, and there's all sorts of great music. I mean, it's beyond my abilities. Uh, sure, but you know, there's uh, uh, different styles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see, uh, you look at. I don't know if you ever do Facebook, but you can. I'm on, I, on Facebook, my Facebook page, every day. <laughs> on my Facebook page, David, there's a, a while we we did a we we sent a whole bunch of photos from from our Tahitian experience, or, uh, because it was the water, the water was cobalt blue. It was electric. Oh, cobalt that's wonderful! Blue. It was just so 
friggin' amazing. And then there's pictures of with a boat sitting on the water inside the lagoon, you couldn't tell if it was levitating because the water and the sky were, were one. It was the colors were just intermingled, transformed uh, into into one. Yeah. And and so and and also there's a video, short video there of me on, with these with this family and Masami in her bikini hugging these dogs, these stray dogs that were just that, that happened to appear on the scene with this family. Huh. And it's just. It's just, huh. you'll, you'll love it. You'd, you'd, you'd like to, yeah, I think you'd, you, love it. you'd have to go to other islands to see water like that here. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it, the way you go for holiday sounds sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, there's, there's good places, good things to do here. Uh, uh, the, in terms of, of what you're talking about in Tahiti, uh, you know, there's 17,000 islands in Indonesia. Uh, yes, of course, yes. zillions of them are not inhabited, but there's other places uh, uh, you could go. Um, there's one in particular I have in mind uh, that where it's supposed to be incredible and just incredible snorkeling and diving. Uh, yep. But um, yep. I don't think we'll make it there. All right. Yeah, uh, we could, cool, we could, yeah. uh, it's, but mm, nah, I don't know. I'll check it. I'll check it out. See if there's any charter company somewhere in in Indonesia that we could we could get a sailboat and sail around the islands. Oh That'd well, really I, good, I know a guy who can. You know, I have a very close friend who has a really nice sailboat. He he probably know, but probably just find out online best oh yeah for sure you know yeah uh yeah yeah also i'm not into boats no to, no. to me the, well, the thing i yeah. want to do when i'm on a boat is get off it <laughs> uh that i'm i you know we're we're 98 percent water so. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's There's no. I don't think we're ninety eight, but we are. I think we really. Are. I think. Uh, I think. Yeah. I think you know. There's a lot. So much space between the our, the 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 atoms in our body. It's all. It's all emptiness anyway. Yeah. Well, that's we true. No, <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you get down small enough, start looking. Well, there's nothing. Um, there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, I know exactly the the lead song in. Uh, now we we finished three albums. There's two albums on the internet. The third one will go <laughs> yeah. up. Uh, we'll be there in a month. Uh, we're just recording now the fourth one, and the lead song is called Zero. Uh, <laughs> and you know the the tagline I guess in it is Zero's where we started and Zero's where we're off. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's absolutely nothing to own and nobody to own it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so water also, it, water is so amazing. I mean, you know, oh. water didn't come from Earth. It's not part of the whole thing. It came from meteorites. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I know. Uh, and, and now we live on this huge blue planet. Yeah. And... So yeah, amazing. I don't know my see. I was uh, I was from a navy family. Uh huh. Um, you know, my parents my parents are from Denmark, and they were my dad was working for the Americans at the end of the war, and so I was born in Annapolis. Oh goodness! So I was on a submarine when I, I'm told I was on a submarine when I was one year old, but I I have no recollection of that. Well, that's but, understandable. <laughs> but my mother. My mother and father, when, when they moved to Michigan and, and we lived on Lake St. Clair, they had a sailboat and they were part of the yacht club. And my mother was, David, was a party animal. So she would, as soon as she got on the boat, it was time to open up a, a bottle of rum and mix some, mix some, uh, make some dark and stormies with some ginger beer and away we'd go. And then, 
you know, we would always be last in the races, and I would be down below. I was so embarrassed by her performance. <laughs> she was having such a good time. Oh. Uh. <laughs> but so I, I you know boats have been in my life all my life, I guess. So I, I, there's no escape for me. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. No, I have so that's why lots I, of friends. Uh, from my, uh, one of my very, very closest friends uh, who will probably listen to this and, and appreciate greatly. He sails on the bay. Uh, he was, you know, he was my agent and I don't know. I, there was really nobody closer. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, he wanted to take me out of the bay. And I said, yeah, because he, he was going like every weekend. He has a nice sailboat. Sure. I said, Michael, I'll, uh, I'm happy to go on your sailboat with you if you need me. Anytime you need me, I will be there. But if you but don't need me, pleasure. I'd rather not. Uh, it's human nature, David, to avoid suffering. Yeah. But finally, <laughs> yeah, finally, Katrinka and I went with him once, and it was wonderful. I loved it. We went under the Golden Gate Bridge, and I don't know if we went under the Bay Bridge. Maybe we went up to it and turned around. But there was a point yeah. at which... What is that? The boom, the bottom. Uh, yeah, the boom is the the boom is the long stick that holds the, the foot of the sail. Yeah, and it, it's the one that goes across. At one point, it came across and knocked the shit out of me. I was knocked out. Oh yeah, that's that's how. There's a the greatest French sailor of all time. One of the greatest of all time is a guy named Eric Tarberly. He was out sailing Penduik many years ago, forty years ago, and one dark night and. He'd been around the world countless times, and in, in one dark night with his crew, he was he got hit in the head by the boom, got knocked overboard. They never found him. Oh my yeah. gosh! So, so that's one of the first things I teach folks is there's this boom, you know, <laughs> it's called boom for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but anyway, that's uh, yeah. My passion right now is uh, is is teaching um, celestial navigation. I've got. I've got this guy, he, he, he's a physicist at the Quantum Institute at U University of British Columbia. And he, his, his, uh, car, his business card says, PhD in physics and astronomy. He approached me and said, I want to learn celestial navigation. I'm sailing with a bunch of guys, all doctors, uh, medical doctors, friends of mine, to Hawaii this summer. And I need to know, in case all the electronics fail, how to find my way to Hawaii by the stars. And I said, "Hey, man, your business card says you're a quantum physicist with a with a degree with a PhD in astronomy." He said, "No, no, no. That's just how they write it. I know absolutely zilch about astronomy." <laughs> that's funny. Wow. <laughs> huh. So, so I'm doing these. I'm doing. I've just done like seven Zoom classes, and uh, with these folks. Teaching them how to how to take how to how to how to you know reduce the sights and reduce the the, the celestial triangle the navigational triangle uh, instead of using logarithms and spherical geometry the old way now we've just got a a couple of books we can take along and just learn how the tables work but you know I teach them in ten I teach everybody I teach all the guys that I work with at building this hospital in ten minutes I tell I, I turn them into celestial astronomers. <laughs> and and being able to navigate right with it and then i just tell them it's all now it's just a matter of, of of a week's work and you'll figure out how to find everything in the tables and then you can reduce it onto a little piece of chart uh the size of a the size of a napkin and on that little chart that you've fabricated this mercator chart you can find yourself within one nautical mile anywhere on the planet oh and at any time oh. and it's 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 really cool. It's just it's just people are just they think it's a big deal to to learn celestial navigation. But my format is makes it really simple. Wow, that is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Well, so that's that's what I'm good yeah. at right now is is that kind of stuff, right? So that's that's what uh, that's what you know that's what I do. Wow. Wow, impressive. Besides playing ukulele and building hospitals and taking care of my lovely wife and family. My daughter is still in university. My youngest daughter, she's uh, studying to be a nurse. She's in her third year now at uh, Simon Fraser mm. here in Vancouver. Mm. 
Yeah. A noble profession. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So same as my oldest daughter. So both of them are been immersed in public health. So it's really mm. cool. I always loved the nurses. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you have to love the nurses. Yeah. Not always <laughs> the doctors, but the nurses were wonderful. No, they just the doctors are just practicing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the nurses take care of you in the end, for sure. So, Larry, I think, I think, but it's now 2.36 in the morning. <laughs> no, it's midnight at the Oasis for you. Yeah, yeah. And you know what, David? I've got, a, I've got so much I have. To, we're on holiday here. It's Easter weekend. And basically during the week, David, I work, I get to work at six o'clock in the morning. I get up at four thirty, do a little zazen, go to go fly off to work. And then I don't get home till five at night. So this, this three day weekend I've got going on now, I've got, my wife has got an endless supply of things I need to do. Yeah. I've actually got a, 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 a whole lot I need to do before my wife gets back from Ubud tomorrow. Uh, a bood. What is a bood? That's the art culture center of Bali. Oh, it's about an hour north. Okay. Yeah. My wife. My wife knows about it. Yeah. She knows everything. Yeah. She's my brain. Yeah. She's my wife's my brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she's got my. She's also my heart. She's got. She's got the best heart. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm. You know, I look at you all on your site, and I, I see stuff you post sometimes. Um, and, uh, 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 yeah, well, bring her, bring her here and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can cook up for you. But, um, uh, yeah. Awesome. yeah. Awesome, David. Well, so, you know, so, um, for now, let's, uh, let's, let's, um, it's been fabulous talking to you, but for now, let's say sayonara and yeah. uh, until we meet again. Yeah. Jamata. Uh, I Jamata, never heard anybody yeah. saying sayonara. Uh, no, oh, no, in fact, no. Jamata, Mata, Matane. Matane. Uh, <laughs> sayonara <laughs> is like is. I think it's more a, a more complete goodbye. Uh, yeah, it's very formal. Yeah, it's very formal. I yeah. Heck I with never. That. I don't think I ever heard it. Uh, I have heard. People say sayonara in Japan. You know, I, but I don't know. I times. mean, I don't remember. I I spoke Japanese. It's very formal. Masami says it's pretty common. Yeah, I mean, I was. She says sayonara to her students. She teaches Japanese. Oh yeah, and she says sayonara yeah. to the students. You say sayonara to your students? Yeah. yeah. They have to learn polite Japanese first. Uh, because they have to learn polite Japanese. So apparently, it's the very polite. Yeah. Way of, you know, there's the polite language, and then there's the familiar language. Right? Yeah. Then you say matane and give everybody nicknames and it's I call I call my wife Machan, right? Oh, that's Instead sweet. Yeah, sure. I understand yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh it's wonderful. Hey, I love you, man. It's yeah. uh, great to speak with you again. Yeah. Great to great well, to Well, the connect. feeling's mutual and um yeah. Until we it's until really great we to meet again. Uh yes, for all sure. All right. Take care. David David, cheers. Yeah. Gasho. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Me too. All right. <laughs> Have a good yeah, evening. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Sweet yeah. dreams. Bye-bye. So thanks a lot, Larry Hansen. Very cool. Very cool. Enjoyed that a lot. Um, and um, why don't you sail on uh, down here to Bali and say hello. This has been a cute Audio podcast. I'm DC Puba of QQ Audio and QQ Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Dog and Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Mm -hmm.